Good morning, everyone. Power of the microphone. Welcome on a beautiful summer day. I'm happy to say that today is my 35th wedding anniversary. AT&T, the Baltimore Business Journal, City Financial, the Constellation Energy Group, the Greater Baltimore Tech Council, IBM, Lockheed Martin, Morgan Stanley, Northrop Grumman, the Tech Council of Maryland, T. R. Price, and Xerox. There's a lot happening at UMBC. We've had a wonderful year. We continue to grow enrollments. Uh, we're actually up or in IT for the fall, which is nice. Uh, we are the third largest graduate of, or third largest university in terms of graduates of IT in the country. Um, and these kinds of partnerships with, with your companies allow us to get the resources and the opportunities for our students. So we're very grateful. Um, this year we've been developing new research centers with the support from NASA and such companies as Northrop Grumman. We have designed and delivered custom training courses for business analysts at T.R. Price. We've connected with IBM, Lake Mason, Lockheed Martin, Morgan Stanley, GE, Constellation, and other local and regional employers with uh, well-prepared interns and hires. Uh, we're proud and encouraged by the support we continue to receive for our special initiatives from our advanced program for women in women faculty in STEM areas uh, to the advancement of CWIT, our Center for Women and in Information Technology. And uh, we look forward to continuing to build those relationships. Jim O'Neill, as I said, serves as the CEO of CompuDyne Corporation, a leading provider of products and services to the public security market, specializing in, in, in institutional security systems, attack protection, I want to know Jim O'Neill better, um, integrated electronics and public safety. He's been a leading executive in the tech industry for more than 25 years with extensive senior management experience focused on intelligence networks and electronics. Most recently, Mr. O'Neill held positions as Corporate Vice President and President of Northrop Grumman's Information Technology Center, one of the world's premier providers of advanced information technology, engineering, and business solutions for government and commercial clients. Uh, in 2008, Mr. O'Neill chaired the Professional Services Council and is Vice Chairman of the Executive Committee for the Northern Virginia Tech Council. He also sits on the board of the Tech Council of Maryland, the Intelligence and National Security Alliance, and the American Heart Association. In 2006, he was named the Government Contractor Executive of the Year in Large Business Category by the Northern Virginia Government Contractors Council, Professional Services Council, and Washington Technology. Please join me in welcoming Jim O'Neill as he shares perspectives on the technology's role in addressing national and global priorities. Now I know what CompuDyne does since it's week two. Thank you. I need a copy of your notes so I can so, well, I had LASIK surgery about five years ago, and what they left out was I can see a flea on a dog at three miles, but I can't read anymore. So, uh, as you can see, the next time I do a speech will be like one word per page. Um, and I think it's 28 font. First of all, thank you very much for that kind introduction, and thank all of you for being here today. It is such a beautiful summer's day, and congratulations on 35 years. That's incredible, really. That's. Uh, <laughs> We're all assuming it's the same lady. Oh, That's really good. That's really good. I just have a quick joke. I was telling my assistant this the other day. I was playing golf with a gentleman the other day, true story. And he said he's been married for 50 years, and he, the last 25 have been just absolutely outstanding. And I, he said, at my 25th anniversary, I took my wife to Italy, and we had a great time. So I, I said to him, well, what are you going to do on your 50th? He goes, go back and pick her up. <laughs> Joke. It was a joke, but he was sincere about it. He, he told it very well. It was, uh, it was funny. But I'm really honored to be here this morning. Your, your institution and all the universities within the state have done just a great job in training our young people for um, life in big technology companies or small technology companies, and it's very important. Um, I'm an IT junkie, but the thing that really makes IT work 
on the people that we hire in companies because it's not the technology, it's really all about the people. And it's a scary, we have a national crisis in my opinion going on, I'll talk a little about this in my speech. I did this speech, a similar speech, about eight months ago when I was at Northrop from the Northern Virginia Technology Council and there was approximately a thousand people in the audience and all of those people for the most part only had masters and doctorate degrees in technology, computer sciences, electrical engineering, etc. And I asked them to raise their hand how many of their children are following in their parents' footsteps. And less than a third raised their hand and said their kids are taking math and computer sciences. Um, my son's here today, Justin, and uh, Justin is a senior at Towson. Sorry, UMBC. Justin's a communication major and his friend is also a communication major. Uh, Melinda next to him, and none of those folks have taken math in their, in their curriculum. It's not a requirement. My daughter is going to American University this year as a freshman, also a communications major. Um, she's going on a lacrosse scholarship from, she went to Severn School here in Severna Park. Um, not required to take any math or science courses. It's not a requirement. And that was part of her decision, um, which, is, which is really interesting to me. Um, the last time I was in this hotel, I did a panel discussion with several, I think several people were there from UMBC and others, and the director of the National Security Agency was there at the time, Mike Hayden, before he became um, director of Central Intelligence. And Mike tells the story of this daughter who was in the seventh grade, and she came home from school in the fall and was complaining to her father that she can't believe they made a mistake in the curriculum for this eighth grade, going into the eighth grade. And Mike said, well, what's wrong? She said, I have to take math again. I already did that. And now think about it. That's, that's really pervasive. And you mentioned earlier that your enrollment is down for IT students as, in terms of minorities, which is really scary. And I'll talk a little about that in the speech. But I really do believe we have a national crisis and the crisis is an intellectual capital. It really is in our country, if not the world. Um, uh, as, you know, as, as you think about what's going on in the world today, you can kind of dissect it. Let me just see if this, uh, this works here. Great. I'm going to just hit on some of these today because I really think this hits the majority. And by the way, you could take this if you put this back 100 years ago or you fast forwarded 100 years. My sense is. Um, defense, homeland security, and public safety would be concerns around national security as we look at where we came from since 1776. You know, change the people, change the days, but it's pretty much the same. Healthcare, I mean, the costs are going up incredibly. There are some 44 million citizens in the United States who don't have healthcare today, which is shocking. It really is. Um, the quality of it and the access to it. And the global competitiveness, you know, um, we've had the luxury as a country to have two oceans separate us for a long period of time, and those supply national security, et cetera, but the world truly really is flat, and we are in a very, very competitive environment. A lot of companies, some of which are in this room, have decided to offshore their capabilities in IT around software development, not because they want to, is quite frankly, is because in some cases they can't be competitive economically, but also, just as importantly, they don't have the skills or the talent in this country in terms of the teachers to teach people anymore. And again, what I'm going to do is go through the speech relatively quick and, and open it up for um, Q&A. Uh, I thought it would be interesting just to kind of reduce these things today into manageable categories. Of course, our time this morning won't allow a detailed analysis of any of these. But I do believe that information technology is the heart and soul of all of these issues today. If you think about it, remarkable progress has been made in genetics, pharmaceuticals, communications, chemistry, physics, and many other disciplines. But it's really the IT engine that drives the initiative. When I was at Northrop, I used to kid my peers who made great platforms in terms of submarines and aircraft carriers and unmanned aircraft, and they did an incredible job. And Northrop is a great company, it really is. And as is Lockheed and all the other defense aerospace companies. But I used to kid at the board meeting that if it wasn't for me in IT, those would be just big nodes floating around the ocean. Because what they really are is information platforms, information technology platforms. An aircraft carrier submarine is a huge node, albeit very expensive, on a network. And the network really drives what a submarine, an aircraft carrier, and an unmanned air vehicle does today. And 
the form of global hawks or predators, which you see all the time on television. Um, for example, today, the Human Genome Project would not exist without the advances that we've made in IT. Today, the systems that you put into a military aircraft are more expensive and, quite frankly, much more relevant to the aircraft than the actual aircraft itself in terms of the wings, the propulsion systems, et cetera. It's really the electronics, it's the, it's the uh, SIGINT capabilities, the image capabilities, and the payloads that are put in these aircrafts that really make the difference. And that's where the money is, that's where really the expense is. And again, the common denominator there is software and software development. It's not, you know, can a, a predator fly or a bubble hawk? The answer is yes. It's really what you can do with that machine when it's airborne and what kinds of things you can collect. So I want to put these issues I mentioned in a four brackets. National security, um, healthcare, global competitiveness, and energy and environment. I mean, $4 plus, they're, they're projecting $5 gas by the time um, this, the summer has ended, is what the latest projection was. I uh, would love to work for ExxonMobil, where they book uh, $9 billion in profit in 90 days. Think about that, $9 billion in 90 days profit. And that's just one company. And by the way, I'm not picking on ExxonMobil, I'm just saying that's the industry by which they're in. But the profits to me seem exorbitant. Um, when Northrop does $32 billion a year and their profits are around two, two and a half um, a year, as opposed to nine billion in 90 days, it seems excessive. But I'm sure that has nothing to do with the gas prices. Um, <laughs> and having uh, two children who drive all the time, uh, I'm using my credit card, I can, it's just amazing, right Justin? <laughs> Gonna get Justin a bicycle. The second bucket is healthcare. Um, and it's really the, the advances in medical science, but it's reducing the cost of healthcare and improving the quality and make it available to everybody. And I think IT will play a huge role in that. And global competitiveness would be the third one, assuring a strong economy, job creation, and competitiveness in a world economy. And I think that's very important. I mean, I think we're very blessed and fortunate to live in the area that we live in, in this area, because of the predominance of the government influence. I mean, the, the, we typically have one of the lowest unemployment rates in the nation. So I think all of us are very grateful for that. And as the BRAC Commission moves, and I think that would be an opportunity for all the educators here in the room, as, as BRAC becomes a reality, especially in Anne Arundel County, I think everybody will be on mopeds or, or on bicycles by the time you get to work. Uh, I used to work in Tyson's Corner. My office is right in the middle of Tyson's. And if you know that area, they're going to close Route 7, one lane, and Route 123 for about five years to put a subway station in there. And I used to tell my employees, we're going to have to leave in September to do Christmas shopping because you'll never be able to get there. Think of the congestion. Um, just as a side note, um, I've been, I moved here 22 years ago with Digital Equipment Corporation, which is no longer, those of you who grew up using faxes can remember digital. And our, there's a particular agency at Fort Meade that used to buy acres of them, not just numbers. They would buy it by the acre in terms of processing power. But I moved here um, 21 years ago for a two-year assignment. Five companies later, um, I'm, I'm still here. I love the area. But this is the first job I've ever had that's in Maryland. And luck would have it, I was on the Maryland Technology Council. And the first day I got to CompuDine, I got a beautiful plaque with a letter saying I'm no longer on the board. So if there's anybody here from the Maryland Technology Council, I really would like you to reconsider that. Now that I have a 10 minute commute and I'm in Maryland, I really would like to be on the Maryland Technology Council since I'm the Vice Chair of the Northern Virginia one. So again, just a, just a hint, the plaque is great, I'd be more than happy to give it back, but I really would like to get back on the, uh, on the board. And the fourth bracket is energy and environment. Accelerating energy efficiency, I think you saw Mr. McCain last night, offered $300 million, I'm not sure he was gonna get that for somebody to come up with an alternative fuel um, besides gasoline. Um, so those of you who are entrepreneurs, and I know several of you are in the room, if you can come up with something that, that will replace gasoline, assuming you live, because the Exxon Mobiles of the world will probably kill you, um, you'd get $300 million, according to Mr. McCain. So let's start with defense. America has a very specific way of waging war. We choose to invest in technologies that will allow our forces to win conflicts as quickly as possible, while sparing as many lives as we can. Think of the unmanned aircraft that have been shot down over the past several years, some of which were Northrop's products. Each pile of wreckage represents an American pilot that was not killed or taken prisoner. 
which is just a huge, huge investment and the right thing to do in terms of technology. This really does speak to the American way of war. The most of the technologies that make it possible can be divided into two groups, assured access and network centricity. And I'll talk a lot about network centricity today. What do I mean by assured access? I'm talking about technologies that give our military the ability to reach out whenever and whenever they need to, that our national leaders deem necessary, and to do so with enough power to accomplish whatever mission those leaders assign. If you recall the airstrikes against Libyan President Gaddafi in 1986, those of you who were at that age remember that. Remember we put a missile right in his parlor, his living room, um, during your day. The strike almost did not happen, and let me tell you why it didn't happen. Because France and Spain decided that we would not, they would not grant us overflight privileges over their country. So our, our aircraft had to take off in Britain, fly out over the Atlantic, around the Iberian Peninsula, strike the target, and return, return by the same route, thus avoiding Spain and um, just avoiding Spain. It added more than 3,000 nautical miles to the mission and made it a lot more dangerous than it needed to be. It's easy to see what kinds of technologies and systems offer assured access. Stealth aircraft, refueling tankers, assuming we can get a contract let for refueling, you know, Northrop won that contract with the ADS. It looks like, it looks like the, the uh, GAO decided to overturn that, so it's gonna be very interesting to see what happens with that. But having, done, I was the chairman of the red team for that when I was at Northrop, and I will tell you that aircraft, um, Northrop's aircraft, Far superior, and I hope I'm not insulting anybody at Boeing here, but it was a great aircraft. The price was great, so I just don't understand what happened. Radar jamming, cyber warfare, warfare, submarines, aircraft carriers, special operation transports, both sea and air. Precision strike and secure communications are key for national defense. The other group compromise, uh, comprises new, those technologies that advance the cause of network centricity. The objective of net network centricity is to clear away as much as possible the fog of war. To answer the four questions that soldiers have been asking since we became a nation and prior to that, centuries before, and it's really simple. To answer the four questions, and the questions are simple. Where am I? Where are my buddies? Where is the enemy? And what is it we're going to do about it? Whether you're Alexander the Great or you're a general today in Iraq or Afghanistan, those are pretty much the same questions you're answering today, given the amount of people, the amount of aircraft, the amount of um, listening devices that are in a battle zone. Over the course of the last century, progress has been made in a lot of these, most notably radio communications. I would tell you, there's a, right on the corner here, if you haven't taken the tour, you should. Westinghouse slash Northrop Grumman has a um, museum over here for electronics. I would encourage all of you to take a tour through that. It really goes back to the late 1800s, early 1900s, where a lot of the communications devices that are used today by our defense really were invented at Westinghouse right here in the Baltimore area, now Northrop Grumman. Um, let me give you an example. One piece of this puzzle is called Blue Force Tracking. Think of a laptop that displays a map picture of your immediate area with friendly units marked in blue and unfriendly units marked in red. Imagine that the map picture moves and changes as you move. No matter where you go or what time of day or night you go there, you will always know where the good guys are, the blue force. If you use it today and have, if we had that today, you remember Jessica Lynch when she drove her convoy when she was in, when she was in um, Iraq? It, she drove into an ambush, her and her peers, because they didn't have a blue force tracking. So we're using maps that were 10 years old, dated 10 years prior, and you know, you know what happened to her and her, her compadres. Um, they still use paper maps, so they had blue force tracking that would not have happened. Sensors, communications, and, inter and in are keys to network centricity. This means integrating unmanned aerial vehicles, satellites, and airborne radars into a graphic representation of the battle space that, that can be assessed by generals as well as privates. And yes, it does, not, it's, it, it does so in such a way that it's user-friendly. If you think about what's going on today in the Defense Department, the kids who are growing up who are entering the Defense Department are 18, 19 years old. And the thing they all have in common, they grew up on Xbox and all these video games. They grew up, those of us who parents bought those expensive games for their kids. 
That's really what the military is using today, that methodology to teach our young folks how, in fact, to wage war. It's done through a simulation, through computer games. So the kids that are entering the armed services today are very computer literate. Some of them haven't taken math or science, but they grew up with Xbox, they grew up with a mouse, they grew up with a PC, and that's the way they expect not just the government to respond, but also the private industry. So they walk into companies like CompuNine and Northrop and Lockheed and AT&T and the other ones that are represented here. Those people that we recruit from colleges expect to be armed with the tools that they're used to, whether it's in college, but more importantly, as how they grew up. They want those PCs, they want to be able to move data, they want to be able to access the internet. I mean, there are, are no such things as going to the library anymore for the most part. They want to go in, pull the data on a particular topic, and assume that it's there. The other is net is homeland security, and includes such things as border security, the security of our coastal waters, and even more basically, the security of our urban areas. As many of you might know, from having followed the various congressional hearings of the 9-11 Commission, the first responders in our major cities, the police, the fire, and medical units, and you saw it, you saw it live on television at 9-11 in New York and in Washington, they seldom knew what the other ones were doing. For example, the city of New York, fire, police, and ambulance had completely different communication devices. They could not communicate with one another at all. Um, New York was the first to tackle this problem with an integrated mobile broadband wireless communication systems that I was privy and it was a pleasure to meet Mayor Bloomberg. He chooses Northrop Grumman over Motorola to put in a wide area network for first responders for the city of New York, the first of its kind in the nation. $500 million. And he did it based on a business justification that he could use that network to do other things such as control the lights in the city, um, to read water meters and gas meters remotely, thus saving a lot of money at the expense of some of the telecommunications companies. But he actually did a, a business analysis of that $500 million investment to put a broad area network, wireless network in, which, which they did. Um, now they can, they can access state, t any terrorist databases. They can do pretty much anything from a police car. But the real home run on this is that they can communicate anywhere in the city. So it's really, it's really quite good. Two ladies here from Northrop Grumman. Hi, hi ladies. These guys used to work with me. Uh, I, I'm saying all the nice things about Northrop. You should have come in a little early and go back. You can ask anybody here. New York, New York City, unfortunately, really is the exception. Last year, the U.S. Homeland Security Administration issued a scorecard of 75 of our largest urban and metropolitan areas. By the way, this included Baltimore and Washington, D.C. The scorecard observes that while most of our major metropolitan areas have plans and policies in place for interoperable communications, the actual implementation of these plans is generally lagging. This is half a decade after 9-11. I will tell you factually that Baltimore and Washington, D.C. specifically have no formal evacuation policies if something happens in those cities. It's pretty scary, and this is almost six years after 9-11. Um, Mayor Bloomberg said uh, the following when he awarded the contract to Northrop Grumman. One of the most important lessons learned from September 11 was that our emergency responders need better access to information and clearer lines of communications in the field. Police Commissioner Kelly agreed, adding, and I quote, the future success of crime fighting and public safety in general is wedded to the ability to quickly access data and share that data. Really key. Other nations, within our, other nations with other policies are also bringing technology to bear on the issues of public safety. The United Kingdom has a program called IDENT-1. Again, it's an, I feel like an advertisement for Northrop, but it is a Northrop database system. It consists of a national identification database, including fingerprints. And they are just starting to introduce a system called Lantern. And just prior to me leaving Northrop, I spent a lot of time in New Scotland Yard. And this Lantern system is a remote system issued in approximately 100 police cars where the police can stop anybody in the United Kingdom and fingerprint them on the spot. You put your index finger on this very portable unit, and within a minute, it will, rec it will come back, it's either you or not. Now, New Scotland Yard is quick to point out their laws are a little different than ours. They start off by the following statement, they are not citizens, they are subjects. 
So the civil liberties is a little different and the rights are a little different in the United Kingdom as opposed to the United States. I don't think that would flow well here in Annapolis if they pulled you over for red light and they fingerprinted you and took you out of your car. I think somebody would probably get a little upset about that. Nonetheless, it's, it's caught about 68 terrorists in the last year and a half, um, which is fantastic. But there is a methodology by which they stop cars too. It's not just they pick any car randomly. There is an algorithm and a, and a methodology by which they pick cars to stop. But nonetheless, they've arrested, and again, this is going back five months when I left Northrop, 66 terrorists have been arrested in the city of London alone using this project, this program. Again, IT, and I think that's great. I really do. If I were a citizen of London, I'd be very pleased that their police have the capability to do that. I really do. The second category facing our nation is health care. There are currently over 44 million Americans without health insurance, and, it, and the cost is soaring. Anybody here, medical bills haven't gone up, your deductibles haven't gone up, no matter how big the company you work for or how small. I mean, it's constant in terms of, and the, the care is, you know, for the most part, is uh, problematic. Uh, this problem is going to get worse as our aging population becomes, you know, we're all going to live to be 80 or 90 years old, like they say now, with the latest in drugs. Figures from the United Nations show that it's a serious issue the world over in different regions. For North America, the UN projects by 2050, the percentage of people aged 60 and over will double. By 2050, 60 and over will double. You better adjust your curriculum at UNBC to have my senior citizen. You have already? Good. And those figures, alarming in their own right, don't take into account the pace of scientific and medical breakthroughs that will lengthen our lifespans. It might be said that our healthcare system is the victim of its own success. For example, scientists are making rapid progress with genetic mapping. This will most certainly result in the ability to head off certain diseases proactively, or at least identify those at risk for certain diseases. Proactive treatment is very expensive. I saw the other day, my wife was diagnosed with melanoma about six months ago, and thank God for John Hopkins, they caught it in time and were able to get it way before it metastasized. But we were noticing the other night, Hopkins now has its own television show, so they get way ahead of UMBC and University of Maryland. I assume you guys will, will follow suit. But one of the things they just discovered at Hopkins is this gene that they, they inject back, they take a gene out that has the, the tumors in it, and they multiply them by billions of cells, and they inject them back into your body. And again, I'm not a doctor by any stretch, but this was melanoma, so we're both listening to it. And nine out of 10 people, the cancer has completely disappeared. And, it, and it's a rare, you know, it's a very advanced form of melanoma. So the research that's being done is just phenomenal. And it's done with high-speed computers, a lot of software. Again, IT is really driving that. Um, let me see what else I can say here about that as I get, as I, as I, uh, get distracted. Things like pandemic flus, bioterrorism will spread at the speed of an airliner. As for bioterrorism, technology places the creation of lethal strains within the reach of more and more fanatics each year. One has to wonder if 9-11, if Osama bin Laden was a biologist instead of an engineer, what would have happened? He would have dropped a strain of, you know, really bad, um, you know, really bad things in our system, water system, et cetera, what would have happened as opposed to killing lots of people in a, in a building. Not that that was good, but thank God he wasn't a biologist. For years, people have predicted that information technology would provide solutions for many of these problems. In fact, IT has made headway against all of them. Um, IT in the health sector are among the lowest. The IT people, the IT portion of healthcare, I'll just give you some facts that are really concerning. The banking industry spends an average of $15,000 per employee per year in IT. $15,000 per employee per year in IT. In healthcare, the figure is $3,000 per employee per year. Most doctors understand how this translates. Recently, Fortune Magazine reports that doctors constantly rank billing and claims processing as their number one problem, even ahead of malpractice. When I was at Northrop, we had approximately 25 doctors that worked in the IT sector, all of which were at the Center for Disease Control. And talking to these people, lots of them were from Harvard and John Hopkins, et cetera, I would ask them, why would you leave a practice with such a 
great pedigree of colleges and universities that you graduated from, and all of them would tell me independently and collectively the reason they just couldn't keep up with the paperwork for the healthcare. It just got so debilitating, um, they just didn't want to do it anymore. They spent hours and hours and hours filling out health care and healthcare forms and then arguing with the with the, the, the providers over claims. And they just got to the point that it was so frustrating, all that education and hard work, they decided to come to work for companies like Northrop and others and work in healthcare, pure research, which was great. Benefit for us, kind of a loss for the consumer. But the reason, it was a terrible reason, is because they're tired of doing paperwork. And a lot of it's still manual if you go into your doctor's office, they're still filling out paperwork manually, which is crazy in this day and age. This is an interesting fact, and it's scary the next time you go to hospitals. This is a fact. The Institute for Medicine reports that between 50,000 and 100,000 people a year in the United States die in hospitals, die in hospitals because of the, because of the lack of automated information systems. Isn't that scary? They're either given the wrong prescription, they're evaluated differently, have the wrong prognosis, et cetera, but 50 to 100,000 estimate die a year in the United States because of lack of automated systems. It's pretty scary. And it's really a challenge to those people who are in IT to really help the healthcare industry because the technology exists. It's not really rocket science, it really does exist. Apart from complicating treatment, the shortcomings raise costs. One in five lab tests and imaging studies are performed simply because the previous results were unavailable. So one in five, every time you go for mammograms, x-rays, you pick, one in five of those is called in from your doctor because they can't find the previous the previous um, report. If you watched the State of the Union last year, you heard the President say, and I quote, we need to reduce the cost of medical errors with better information technologies, unquote. The applause was followed in a bipartisan manner. Some of the speed bumps in expanding IT in the health, and care, in the health sector are a need for records privacy and the different laws and policies among the states in place to protect it. There is currently a pilot program underway to harmonize all these different privacy policies with federal law. It makes electronic health records available to clinicians nationwide and interconnects healthcare professionals with local, regional, and national records exchanges. This effort could contribute to the National Health Information Network. Listen, work being done by the Department of Defense could also help bring this, this potential of IT to the healthcare sector. They have set up, the, the Defense Department has set up a health information exchange for their 9 million members, which makes electronic health records available to clinics nationwide. The DOD could blaze the trail for the rest of the country. And big companies, a lot of the companies up here represented, as well as small companies, are hoping the Department of Defense do that. And I think that's going to be a home run. The third category of concern for most Americans could be titled global competitiveness. How do we maintain our global economy, national influence and leadership in a world economy that every year grows more and more defiant of national borders? First, I think we have to resolve ourselves to the fact that, like the march of technology itself, the global economy is here to stay. This is true even for the high-tech industries that we Americans excel at. Last year in aerospace, for example, the joint Italian-British firm of Augusta Westland along with Lockheed Martin won the contract to supply the next generation of White House, White House helicopters for the Americans' future presidents. The same trend applies to more down-to-earth sectors as well. American auto workers built Hondas with parts imported from around the world. These cars are American-made, even though Honda's corporate headquarters is in Japan. Fords are now manufactured in Russia, though Ford's corporate headquarters is located in North America. Since we cannot run away from this global economy, we better learn to master it, and master it we can, because international markets pose not just challenges, but great opportunities. Yes, American businesses have to connect with low-cost labor in India, China, Eastern Europe, and other locations. And yes, our nation has been offshoring jobs to these places for some time now. But we also, also are starting to see opportunities for onshoring, keeping jobs away and moving those jobs within the United States. Um, there is a precedent for this. So let's return to the automobiles. As you know, Ford just um, reported its worst year in 103 years in terms of its financial health. The rest of the big three are also having problems. 
but Mercedes, Toyota, Hyundai, Nissan, and others are opening plants in North America. They're building plants in rural America. Last year, Northbrook Bremen opened an IT center in Southwest Virginia. It will bring 400 good paying jobs to that part. And you talk about rural. I was born in Ireland. I had no idea how rural Western Virginia was. It's 30 miles from where Daniel Boone was born, and I kid you not. It's a big sign when you land at the airport. Um, you have to bring your passport with you if you go through three immigration times. Just kidding. But it is really, really rural. But Northrop made a very conscious decision, and I think the right decision, and I know other aerospace companies are doing this as well, that rather than offshore, why not onshore? Why not invest in the United States as opposed to investing in foreign countries? And what Northrop did, um, in the IT sector, and I think the rest of the company is looking at this as well, they opened up rural areas within the United States. I think the last count was eight or nine that they had, Tom Shellman's group had eight or nine, I believe, that they opened up, and they're in, they're in Corsicana, Texas, Omaha, um, outside Omaha, really rural areas of the country, and here's, here's the business the business plan, what, they, what the company does, they work with local universities or community colleges, they give them money. In this case, we gave Wise University in, in um, Virginia a million dollar grant to open up a computer science um, courses. We supplied some Northrop IT professionals to help them get the curriculum going. We built a call center and data center there. So when those students graduate, they will literally stay in their hometown. They'll get paid really good wages. They will be part of the information highway network. So they have high tech jobs in areas of the country that they were brought up in. So why move to Northern Virginia? First and foremost, there's no one, there's, you can't, there's no room left, for one. But why not keep those jobs in the United States? High paying jobs, um, it, it's, it's a great idea. It, the, it, it's a no, there's no downside to doing that. And quite frankly, it, you know, our customers almost demand it if you're in the aerospace defense industry. The last thing they want, in, they want to know at the Department of Defense or the National Security Agency that you're doing your software development in, in India. They just have an adverse effect of doing that. So I think that is a great business model. I, I think other companies are doing that also. And I think that's the way to go in the, faster, in the future. Globalization does not have to be a threat, but master of it assumes a healthy free market. There is good for, it's, it's really good for us because ideas, innovation, vision, manage risk, are uh, all what America stands for. That's what we do best. And the more of that we do, the better we become. Every age has its governing commodity. In past times, it may have been precious metals, military power, agricultural surplus, trading, or financial acumen. Master the governing commodity of your age, and you stay out in front. For many decades, up until 30 or 40 years ago, the government commodity of our age was industrial capacity. And I just want to give you some figures that I think are startling. We were the kings of that commodity, hands down. On December 7, 1941, the Imperial Japanese Navy had 10 aircraft carriers to our seven in 1941. 10 Japanese aircraft carriers to our seven. By war's end, three and a half years later, they had four still floating and we had 100. Just think, when our nation gets behind a national crisis, what we can do. Back 40 years ago, it was an industrial revolution. We could manufacture that many aircraft carriers. Today, Northrop Grumman's Newport News is the only one who makes nuclear aircraft carriers, and it's usually four to five years before a carrier gets shipped once, once the contract is let, and that's ambitious. But think about it, three and a half years, we built 100 aircraft carriers as a nation because that's what the nation needed, and it was a national crisis. But the, go the governing commodity of our age is no longer industrial capacity, and this is where this room really comes in. Today it is intellectual capital. We lead the world because we lead that commodity. It is the basis of our leadership in pharmaceuticals, medicine, communications, computers, aerospace, genetic engineering, defense technologies, and many other categories. If we lose our leadership in intellectual capital, we lose our position of leadership in the world. And that's the rub, ladies and gentlemen, because we're not keeping up with that commodity. For several years, America has been bracing for a tidal wave of retirements of our best technical minds. When that wave hits, and it's only a couple of years away, 
we will have difficulty replacing them. In recent years, U.S. universities have graduated around approximately 70,000 engineers per year. Meanwhile, India graduates 200,000 engineers per year, and China 500,000 engineers per year. And the quality of those engineers arguably is just as good as the engineers that graduate from some of the universities and colleges that are represented in this room. Again, going back to my earlier comment with the Northern Virginia Technology Council, and I can, my son is a communications major at Towson, my daughter is going to American, and the common thread both of them have, math and science is not a requirement. As a matter of fact, they avoid it like the plague. Um, those of you who are engineering backgrounds or computer scientists, how many of your children are following in your footsteps by a raised pin? Two out of approximately 100 people in this room. Scary. That's, that's, the, that's the commodity that we're so far behind. You mentioned earlier that you're way behind in UMBC in, in recruiting and retaining a minority candidates in the form of women for computer sciences. I think companies like Northrop and others could help you in that. I, I really do believe that. American students are avoiding math and science in high school and college. As Tom Friedman said in his book, The World is Flat, and I quote, I dare you to find an 11 year old in America who wants to be an engineer today. No students who do want to take math and science have trouble finding the teachers. <coughs> U.S. school districts need to hire 240,000 middle school and high school math and science teachers by 2010 to correct the shortage. Think about that. A quarter of a million people need to be hired in the next two years to backfill those openings for math and science in middle and high school. That's pretty scary. It's really not a problem we can ignore anymore. Nearly a year before the September 11 attacks, the U.S. Commission on National Security in the 21st century, headed by Senators Gary Hart, remember Gary Hart, and Warren Redmond of New Hampshire, concluded that among other things, the quote, and I quote, the inaccuracies of our system of research and education pose a greater threat to the United States national security over the next quarter century than any potential conventional war that we could imagine. Unquote. Isn't that scary? There is, that's where UMBC and others play a critical role. You are helping us overcome our deficit and strengthen our role on the world stage. Between 2003 and 2006, UMBC has a 38% increase in the number of women faculty in math, science, and IT fields. At least that's the, the information. Is that true? That's great. This is a great achievement, and other schools need to really emulate this. This helps us prepare our students for the new world. And by the way, the new world is here today. On balance, globalization has been good for everybody. The world economy, world economy is expanding at a rate of 4.4% after inflation, and nation after nation has moved from dysfunctional and centralized economics to free market systems. In turning away from the past practices, these nations performed a collective act of courage. But this is often the price for progress. Gary Hamill of the Harvard Business School said, and I quote, studying the future is not the ability to see the future, it's the ability to walk away from part of the past, unquote. The way to keep our place in the world's foremost economy is not to try to hide from the new global economy, but to master it. Intellectual capital is the key, and we have to renew our leadership of that commodity. Finally, there's the category of energy and the environment. Obviously, technology has a critical role to play in the solution of our dependence on foreign oil and our protection of our environment. It is providing particularly useful in making existing energy sources more efficient. I agree that these issues will eventually require solutions that are a bit more revolutionary than evolutionary. For example, we might make an internal combustion engine more efficient. What is really needed is a quantum leap in battery capacity, thus Mr. McCain yesterday putting in a $300 million reward up for somebody who can come up with an alternative fuel. To that end, however, the solutions we have will be market-based. Therefore, technology will make its greatest contribution when it can be synchronized to the marketplace. This means embracing the basics of business, business 101, coming up with a product that is energy efficient, environmentally friendly, and desired by customers it really is the magic formula. Electric cars have been around for years, but even subsidies have not brought them really into the market the way they need to. Americans are affluent and independent-minded. 
enough that we will pay extra for any kind of gas that we need to drive our expensive SUVs and cars. That's just who we are. Technology has been a continuous tale of problems solved and problems created. And I think this is an interesting fact. But the stair steps have clearly gone upwards on the graft of human conditions. They have gone upwards on the graft of environmental conditions as well. The Industrial Revolution gave jobs to millions. It also gave us the modern city with all its modern problems of pollution. I was talking to somebody earlier about Los Angeles in terms of the pollution there, overcrowding and disease. For example, the advent of a 24-hour factory shift created the need for illumination, a need that helped create the whaling industry almost destroying the species. What saved the whales was the petroleum industry, which brought us kerosene. Its byproduct was gasoline, so useless at first that it was flushed down sinks and thrown into rivers. Imagine having that gasoline today. Electrification also helped solve the need for illumination and teamed with another technology to solve another problem that grew out of the modern city, the horse. This is an interesting fact. Those of you who want to know, you know, you can go home and tell your wives this. In the 1880s, the people of New York City shared their town with 170,000 horses. They pulled carriages, streetcars, but they also produced 43 gallons, 43,000 gallons of urine per day and 25 tons of manure every day. I'm sure you wanted to know that at breakfast, right? 43,000 gallons of urine per day and 2,500 tons of manure every day in the city of New York. The manure spread t t uh, tetanus and the flies spread typhoid. And the 15,000 dead horse carcasses produced every year were often tossed into the rivers and lakes in the city of New York. Some visionaries saw the new automobile technology as the savior for our cities, and to the extent it was, the electric, oil, and auto industries made possible by a free market economy that rewarded innovation, soon drove out the horses out of the cities, making it livable and improving the environment. Today, we're looking for ways to reduce greenhouse gases caused in part by automobiles. I cannot tell you the solution we look like, will look like, but I will tell you this much, that the solution will come in the form of, come, of combination of technology, free market initiatives, and not in the form of government program controls or trade restrictions. I'll also bet you that whatever solutions we find to the problems of greenhouse gas emissions will produce other problems that we can't foresee today. So these are the issues of our times, national security, health care, globalization, and energy and the environment. The good news is that the potential of technology to solve our problems is far from used up. In fact, it's just getting started. Let me leave you with a quote from British historian Paul Johnson. He said, and I quote, the species Homo sapiens is less than one million years old. Civilization has existed for about 8,000 years. The Industrial Revolution occurred less than 250 years ago. We've harnessed electricity for only 150 years and atomic power for half a century. The rate of advance is accelerating very fast indeed, yet the pace is going to quicken as we, at, at a speed we cannot even imagine. We are only at chapter one in the story of humanity and its glories, unquote. As long as it accompanied by good judgment, careful planning, technology has much to offer to these challenges. These are really exciting times, ladies and gentlemen. I think we're all very fortunate and blessed to be in the times that we're in today. Those of us who are in the technology sectors who, who, who can advance technology on a day-to-day -day basis, I think are really, really blessed, and that's the exciting part. Thank you for your time this morning. I'd be more than happy to take any, any questions you may have. So all of you will go out of here with the urine and the manure stories, and that's what I will leave you with. Yes, sir. Yeah, a couple comments first. Um, my name is Larry Davis, and I formerly worked for Siemens and worked in the toilet bowl building in McLean. Do you know where I'm talking about? Yes, I do. Okay. Um, and Siemens also bought the Westinghouse Energy side of the business. Uh, one of the things that Siemens is doing is that they're very, they have the same problem. They're, they have a problem getting engineers. So what they have done is they actually, there's a, of the 70,000 U.S. employees, about 20 to 25,000 of, 25, of them actually go into elementary schools 
and we have a program on science, and it's fun. Uh, the second piece of it, in the middle school and high school areas, we actually have some other science programs, and we try to bring students into our locations. The third piece is the Westinghouse Scholarship Program. We actually have tripled that program, and the Westinghouse Science Program, which is now the Siemens Program, program is a scholarship, but it's a science fair. And it's a science fair like you've never seen before. That's great. And but so my comment to you is you talked about the issues of why aren't the students pursuing the avenues of engineering and IT. So my question to you is and I was in a couple meetings with Larry Ellison and his philosophy is very similar to the US Siemens president. If you got a complaint, give me a solution. Or try to give me a solution. So what are your thoughts on a solution to try to get the students in their body? Well, I think uh, it's twofold. Uh, in, in general, I think you need to get kids excited about math and science at a much earlier age. Um, take them to NASA Goddard, show them that they really, kids need to visually see something. It's very difficult to demonstrate software. Or take them to a Lockheed or take them to a Northrop Grumman and show them an unmanned air vehicle. Show them something tangible that is, in fact, are made through science and technologies pushing the bleeding edge. By the way, what I, what I neglected to say about those 77,000 students who graduate from the United States universities and colleges with degrees in math and science, approximately half of those people are foreign nationals, which adds to the complexity also of, of aerospace and defense companies who require that you have to be a US citizen to, to work for those companies. Um, there is some legislation, I was part of it when I was at Northrop, to look at trying to ease some of those requirements because some of those students are so brilliant and by the lack of jobs in the aerospace and defense industry, um, in terms of because they're not, they're, not, they're not naturalized citizens, well, you, you force them to go into other industries or you force them to go back to their native countries, which is a loss for the United States. We educate those folks here. And then because we can't get them jobs that are of interest and economically viable, they're forced to go back to their own country, some of which want to do that, but also, but it really puts a strain on big, on any company that's looking for people who they can get cleared to work on U.S. government. There's got to be a way, and uh, I worked with Mike McConnell before, when Mike was at Booz Allen, and now Mike, as you know, is the, is the head of intelligence for the, for the government way to partition the work to be done so you could segregate it, for the lack of a better term, in those things that really do require security clearances and those things that don't. And if you look at a lot of the software development, um, whether it's for the DOD or, or a commercial company, you can do a lot of that in the open before it gets classified. And we as a country and we as an industry tend to quantify everything, oh, that's classified, therefore you need to be a U.S. citizen to do it. That's great and it's, it's worthwhile, but the problem is that if you look at the demographics, you look at the numbers I just read, you know, we're looking to hire 240,000 elementary and high school teachers between now and 2010, which is what, a year and a half from now, just to backfill the lack of talent and to get those students excited. Because if you get the students excited in grammar school and high school and elementary school, and if you don't have the teachers, that, that excitement will dwindle very quickly. So I think education is absolutely the key. And I think one of the solutions, I think the solution, is harmonizing the educational organizations in this room and others with large and small companies. Um, mostly large companies who can afford the, you know, the economic investment. But I really think it's the marriage of those two institutions with the government in some way, not as an oversight, but as a participant, as a partner, to get those, to get the three-headed stool in one room and say, this is a national crisis. Like I mentioned, if we can build 100 aircraft carriers in three and a half years, we sure as hell should be able to fix the teacher issue, as well as the, um, the, the lack of scientists and mathematicians. I mean, NSA is a huge problem attracting mathematicians and scientists for their for their mission as well. So that all the agencies, it's not just it's not just the defense industry on the commercial side, it's also our customers having as these people retire, a lot of people don't want to go into government service anymore because the economy is pretty good in this area. And those who do really don't have the background in math and science to make and we see that um, in terms of the acquisition policy. Years ago when I started this business, almost 30 years ago, 
typically people who would make the determination to buy a collection platform or a submarine or, or something of that nature or electronic warfare, they were usually engineers on the other side of the table who had a broad and in-depth knowledge of the technology and they really could differentiate best value. Today it's, and I don't say this disparagingly, today it's, it's people like myself with liberal arts degrees who've been in the government for a long time who are making those determinations in, in a very technology-rich environment um, based on usually low cost. And uh, we see that all the time. So it's very difficult to, to, to put a value proposition in front of the government today when the evaluation criteria is low cost. And I think a lot of us have seen that today. You shake your head in some cases because low cost does not necessarily mean best value. Um, but I really think that, a long-winded answer, I really think the educational institutions, along with the large companies who have a vested interest with participation from the government is the only way to solve the problem. You have to get kids interested in it, and in order to do that, you have to make it fun, right? And that's the key. I mean, you know, fun for kids, even for adults, is really what you want. Yes, sir. Uh, James, it was a great talk, um, like covering most of the issues. Um, what's your opinion about immig skill immigration as an issue and opportunity from technology standpoint? Well, um, I, I can speak on immigration because um, the first five years of my life in the United States, my friends used to take me into the post office and say, alien, alien, and I used to have to register every January because I became a naturalized citizen. I was born in Ireland. I became a naturalized citizen um, in 1976. Um, so I know the immigration pretty well. In those days, it was green cards. I'm not sure if they have green cards anymore. Uh, maybe they do. but. I think we attract, as a nation, our universities and colleges are world class, and we typically attract those students who are the best in terms of academics. A lot of them are, are steeped in electronics, mathematics, computer sciences, and they come to the United States to go to great universities and colleges and they graduate. So the opportunities for those people to stay in this country once they graduate, with the exception of the aerospace and defense industry, are quite plentiful, and I, I don't see that. I don't see that waning one bit. I think, if anything, um, and my son's in the audience today, our communications major here. I wish he would have taken engineering and science. My sense is he would have had a much easier job search if he had that in terms of his degree. So I think, if you want to be employed, you want to make a good living, contribute, and have fun. I think engineering and computer sciences are the way to go. Not at the expense of liberal arts, because the liberal arts guys and ladies rule the world, the C students, right? But I mean, those engineers, I'm kidding, but those engineers, it's, it's a great job. And I'm not an engineer, but hanging around engineers for 30 years, I have gained a huge appreciation of just how smart they are and how really difficult their job is, especially on some of the bleeding edge development contracts that they have to invent something. You know, it's it always, I would leave work every night, I still do even in a small company, CompuDyne, and I'm just amazed at how intelligent engineers are in general, in terms of being able to address and have a process to fix a problem. Um, it's, it's wonderful, it really is. And I see in terms of the employment in this country, I mean, look, pick up the paper every day, you know, Java, you, you pick, right? Very few for um, degrees in sociology, Sorry, Justin, communications and others. Um, it's really engineering and math. My sense is if you have a degree in that, it gives you so much flexibility, too. You can pretty much do whatever you want. Right, Gloria? Gloria is our the vice president of manufacturing and software development for Northrop Grumman. Now, Gloria, stand, stand. Oh, come on, Gloria. Yeah, all these people are going to come for a job after, so you might as well stand now. But Gloria was, when I worked at Northrop, she was one of our CIOs, and she did a great job. But again, a great example of somebody with a technical background who can really matriculate through large companies because of her technical background. She do software development one day, be a CIO of a company the next. So it gives a lot of, uh, lots of, um, of room for advancement. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'll be here for a while. Thanks for having me. Thank you all for coming today. This is the final forum of this year. We will see you in the fall. If you have suggestions for speakers, please uh, don't hesitate to email us. We'll be planning uh, over the summer for next fall. So enjoy the summer. Thank you. Thank you.